All right, this is the Pro Wrestling Illustrated Podcast. I'm your host, PWI Senior Writer Al Castle, joined once again by my co-host, Brian Salmon. What's going on, Brian? Doing okay, Al. Happy to be here as always. Yes, hope you enjoyed the uh, the holiday weekend. And uh, also joining us on this episode, we've got uh, a lot of women's wrestling uh, to talk. So we have one of our resident women's uh, expert, proprietor of, uh, is it Bells to Bell? Bell to Bells, right? Yes. yes. Bell to Bells. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kristen Ashley, what's going on? Good. I'm good. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us. Um, like I touched on, we got a lot uh, to cover with uh, a loaded weekend of, of big events. I haven't even, you know, we're doing a little pre-show prep here. I haven't even mentioned um, the NXT show, which I didn't watch, so I shouldn't even bring it up. Uh, but there was a new women's champion there, too. Uh, yeah. So uh, a really, you know, it's like I'm not even exaggerating about half a dozen major women's title changes in the span of three days, something like that. Um, yeah. So a lot going on there and uh, coming off a night of champions, coming off AW double or nothing. Uh, and also since we last spoke, uh, sadly the passing of, of superstar Billy Graham, uh, one of the few remaining WWF world champions, right? From from that era, we just, we're just down to the, the last few. So certainly significant. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Right now, let me tell you about the latest issue of Pro Wrestling Illustrated. It is our annual Super Cards uh, issue. This is a fun one that uh, we brought back a couple of years ago. This was a staple of our magazines in the uh, 80s and 90s, where we cover um, a slew of major wrestling events, uh, not the least of which is WrestleMania. I've got the list here of the shows uh, covered in this magazine. Uh, WrestleMania 39, AEW Revolution, New Japan Collision, Impact Rebellion, All-Star Grand, Queendom, Lucha Libre World Cup, 16 karat gold, Super Card of Honor, uh, and then a uh, quick card. So we've got uh, cards from CMLL, MLW, NWA, GCW, Grand Princess 23, and um, the uh, ECWA Super 8 tournament. So pretty much fills up this whole magazine, and it's just super cool. I mean, one of the things that uh, PWI has always really been known for is uh, those great action shots, you know, that really bring you ringside, and it's, it's how you get exposed to um, some talent and some promotions that you might not know uh, otherwise. Uh, and it is all here. Go over to pwi-online.com uh, and check it out. Because this is so filled with uh, the Supercards coverage, I don't have a whole lot that I did here. How about you guys? Did you contribute much in here? Uh, in the new columns, I guess? It's Yeah, I have my I have one of my columns in there, the lockup. Uh, way, way it was, poor way it was. It always gets up <laughs> for space. That's okay. I'm just glad to do it. Yeah. How about you, Kristen? Are you in here? Yeah, I did the Grand Princess one, and okay. that's always fun doing TJPW because, yes, there are women, but there's also a lot of hijinks in TJPW, so it's always really fun writing about those. Like that, yeah. that huge panda, you know, it's always just really fun writing about them. It's not just traditional, you know, play-by-play. -play. Yeah, and again, that's the way I think we're kind of the new uh, PWI meets the old PWI um, returning to the Super Guards, which again was uh, a very kind of traditional wrestling feature, but uh, incorporating um, some promotions that might not have gotten coverage, uh, certainly 20, 30 years ago, but maybe even a few years ago. So uh, mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Another really fun uh, issue. Go over to uh, pwi-online.com and uh, check it out. Um, you know, WrestleMania is, is always a big um, uh, destination for our coverage uh, on this issue. And he had two of us there in person. Uh, me and Candace both there. So uh, some kind of on the ground reporting there and uh, a lot more. Uh, again, go check it out. Whether you want to just pick up the one issue, subscribe to the print edition, have it delivered to uh, your home, subscribe to the digital edition, and um, you'll get the magazines a lot uh, faster and customized uh, to your uh, mobile device and a deep, deep discount. Once again, pwi-online.com. And I should mention, I just saw the ad in, in the back of uh, the issue. Uh, now you, uh, we've got bundles where you could get both the uh, the print edition uh, and the digital. So if you don't want to have to uh, decide on one or the other, you can now get both. pwi-online.com. Check it out there. Uh, uh, Brian, let's talk a little bit about superstar uh, uh, Billy Graham, who we lost uh, here since we last recorded the, the last episode. Um, uh, you know, a couple of things, frankly, like it, it, it's been clear to me that he's been in bad health for a while. I feel like we've had these these kind of doom and gloom stories about Billy and his health um, for for probably a decade or more. more. I would and, more. and uh, really for for forty years when I was a kid, 
I remember him being in bad health. I remember him showing up on some of these talk shows, uh, struggling to to walk uh, and get around. And I was, um, you know, one of the things I was most surprised about with his passing was his, his age. He wasn't even 77 years old, which, you know, that big comeback that that I remember because that was the one that was kind of my age group and I guess yours as well. I think he would have been younger than we are uh, uh, now. So, um, uh, yeah. you know, I, I guess it speaks to to some of the uh, the, the, the damage um, that uh, he suffered over his career and, and frankly, he inflicted on, on himself probably in a lot of ways um, over his career. Uh, but but talk a bit about, and we've heard it a lot, we've heard, you know, about there's no Hulk Hogan without uh, superstar Billy Graham and, and so many others. Um, talk a bit about his legacy and, and the influence that, that he left on the sport. It's really hard to overstate it because it's just like he's one of those kind of like BC and AD people. It's like there's wrestlers before superstar Billy Graham and then there's wrestlers after superstar Billy Graham because like, you know, there had been those bleach blonde kind of like super tan, arrogant kind of heels before there was Buddy Rogers and people like that. But but he kind of took it and put it into like outer space. You know what I mean? Like to to like not another level, but like 12 other levels. And, and it's hard to understand because I, I was talking about this on my own podcast, how like in the moment, the, the difference of, of and the accomplishments of what he did are so clear because now we're living in the wrestling environment that's post Billy Graham. So there's so much that's influenced by him. But when he came out, you know, especially when he came to the Worldwide Wrestling Federation in the late 70s, it was like somebody coming down from another planet, like like just from outer space. And uh, the promos, the look that he had, the muscles that he had, that was not a common thing in wrestling. There had been a couple of big body guys, but I mean, especially not in, in the WWF. It was very, you know what? It was a very conservative territory at the time. It was Bruno. It was, you know, the humble baby faces always winning. And then you have this arrogant, like hugely jacked up guy just talking crap and beating everybody. It was a very new thing. And um, like you said, Hulk Hogan obviously is the most obvious copycat. Like, yes, there absolutely would be no Hulk Hogan without him. There'd be no Ric Flair. There'd be no Scott Steiner. Triple H took huge things from him. Jesse the Body Ventura. And not only that, but then you have all the guys that copied those guys. Yeah. So it's like this endless, I don't know what you want to call it, like like a title effect or chain reaction that he created. Just And he himself taking things from Muhammad Ali in the promos that he did. And just like the energy. That's the thing. Like if you watch, I've said this to people, if you watch his promos especially, especially – Watch the live ones where it's like he's at the garden and there's 20,000 people there. You can understand when you watch that why people will say, oh, you know what? A lot of people thought it was real back then. You watch that and you understand it because it's like the energy that he's giving off is so real and so believable. And you feel it because he feels it. It's like it's such a rare thing. And it's not an exaggeration to say that if Vince the Jr. had been in charge at that time, he could have gone national with him instead of Hulk Hogan, which I think is why we got Hulk Hogan because yeah. he could he couldn't do it. You know, when he wanted to do it seven years later or whatever it was, like we were saying, Superstar was already falling apart, sadly. And um, you know, I think if it had been 77, 78, would have been because they would have turned him for sure. It would have been superstar Billy Graham, but his health did degrade, like you said. I think when he had that comeback, and I remember it too, because that's when I first – I had heard about him just from growing up in the New York area. Like wrestling fans would talk about him even when I was a kid already. But in 86, 87, when he came back, I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be – like I've, I know who this guy is. Like my, you know, I hear my dad talking about him. Like this is going to be cool. And he, I think he, he suffered like his career-ending injury in his first match back. And he kind of like hobbled along for like another mm -hmm. six months or whatever it was. And he just couldn't do it anymore. But it was this, you know, look, he was one of the first steroid freaks of wrestling. There's no way to sugarcoat it. And the problem is because he always used to talk about, you know, uh, he, he would kind of prognosticate about how this is what the future of all of you guys look like. And that didn't always that didn't happen to everybody. And I think that's important because. 
because he was one of the first and because he was starting to do those anabolic steroids and things back in the 60s when he was a bodybuilder, you know, I'm not I'm not advocating for the use of steroids at, at all. I think it's good that they're not, you know, anywhere near as much a thing in wrestling anymore because they're dangerous and harmful. But especially back then, they didn't have the level of understanding of the of how to take them the most safe way you can without destroying your body, which I think they learned later on. And unfortunately, Billy Graham was kind of like the guinea pig and he destroyed himself. I mean, he was doing things you should never do to your body, like like talking about and he's this is no tales out of school. He talked about this. I mean, like taking horse, like animal growth hormones, you know, yeah. and taking like seven times the the amount that of of uh, of even acceptable kind of levels of of steroids that you would ever want to put into your body like just multiple times the amount not really thinking about the future and what he was doing to his body and, and it's unfortunate because man he could have he could have kept on going his run was so short 5 mm -hmm. years or so from when he first really hit it big in the AWA and then coming to the WWF, it was like five, six years. And then he was done after that, pretty much. And and a huge success in that time. So it wasn't that the run was a failure because he uh -huh. had, what was it, 19 out of 20 sellouts at the Garden, something like that. I, I think mean, it's 20 out of 22, which yeah. is the high, or 21, which is the highest ratio of sellouts at the Garden for anybody. And I think there's only a handful of people that even had more than 20, like Bruno. Right. And I, I think he had more sellouts at the Garden than Hogan did, actually. Yeah, and you do think if he got that baby face run, because really that character, you mentioned Muhammad Ali, and, and that's what I kept on thinking about watching some of the back of those old promos. It was, I mean, you could call it that an imitation because it is so clear that that's what he, he's doing in those. Yes. But he was the one that was was smart enough and, and visionary enough to bring that into the wrestling product. And, and you think about, as you touched on, you know, who were the champions at that time and what was the mold of a champion it's a little drab, right? I mean, you think about the guys who who were the draws and the long term champions, whether it was Bruno or uh, Backlund or Pedro Morales, just guys in trunks, and they cut they cut these very earnest, you know, promos. Um, and and here was the first guy kind of bringing sports entertainment, yeah, um, to WWF before it was even a thing. That's that's important. Like if you you talk about sports entertainment, that's true. He's the beginning, and Vince Junior, and there's other guys too. There's Dusty Rhodes, but guess what? Dusty right. Rhodes copied a lot of Billy Graham too. Right? Clearly, like took. They were contemporaries, and it was Dusty going like, "Wow, that sounds great! I'm going to do that. I'm going to." And with Dusty, that. you always had to get past the look that he was not right. the best looking guy, not the best conditioning. Uh, Billy had that part of it, right? I mean, I, I remember again that older version of Billy Graham that came back in the mid '80s. Yeah, older. He was like a, 43. You know I know, I mean? <laughs> but I think it, I remember as a kid thinking he looked cool then, right? Yeah, I mean, he, he had the tie dyed shirt, he had like the walrus mustache, the ridiculous arms. Uh, as you touched on, even then the arms. Uh, there, there was something about his physique that looked particularly unnatural, and I think maybe it was because he was starting to look like kind of an older guy, but but an older guy who was just sort of swollen um, all the time. So he was he was bigger when he had that '80s comeback. He was even bigger than he'd been in the '70s. But like you know, Vin, Vince Junior. Superstar was was like his favorite guy, and I mean, look. Guess what did he dis what did he call all the wrestlers after him? Superstars. Why yeah, do you think that that's is? That's a good point. Like that's a word that came into the conversation. Like Superstar Billy Graham got it from Jesus Christ Superstar, which came out was a musical that came out at the time that he was just kind of skyrocketing in the early 70s. So he took that word, and that's how that word came into pro wrestling. And then Vin Vince basically just named his wrestlers superstars. Because of superstar Billy Graham. I mean, like, that's as much of an influence. And it's not to say, like, people like Bruno or Pedro were were boring or anything. They weren't. They were very earnest. They had a lot of fire. People believed in them. They got behind them. But it just was a whole different animal. I mean, at the time that he came in, not only did you have Bruno, but, like, the NWA would have people like Jack Briscoe, who were, like, soft-spoken you know, the, the AWA had Vern Gagne, who, you know, and I mean, they were starting to experiment with some more colorful heel champions like Nick Bockwinkle and Terry Funk in the NWA. But but superstar Billy Graham, it was lightning in a bottle. And it's a shame because the thing is, Vince's father, again, very conservative promoter, and he only ever saw superstar Billy Graham as a bridge, as, as a as a way to get to Backland. He had promised Backland the belt. He wanted this squeaky clean, all American 
kind of champion. He like an NWA champion, this real clean cut guy. That's what he wanted. And in his mind, Billy Graham was just there to hold the place until they got Backlund ready. Cause Backlund was kind of an unknown commodity and they needed a year or they felt they did to build him up, get the fans behind him. And so Backlund was somebody, I mean, superstar was someone they could confidently put the belt on. He would sell out and then they'd switch it. But superstar Billy Graham was mentally and emotionally destroyed because he thought, I'm going to prove to them that I deserve to keep it. That's really what he thought. When they gave him the belt, they literally said to him, you're going to win it on this date. You're going to lose it 10 months later on this date. That's the plan. But in his mind, he thought, holy cow, I'm selling out every month. They're going to change their mind. They're going to say, wrong. Yeah. right. They're going to say, this is fire. Like we are we got to keep this going. Why are we going to, no offense to Bob Backlund, why are we going to put it on this guy who looks like, you know, Opie from, from Mayberry? Like, what are we doing <laughs> here? This guy is like a god. He's a superhero. And that never happened. And he was never the same after that. He actually went into a deep depression. He wound up on, on drugs and over-medicating and things. And it was because of that. I know it sounds silly. People, you know, wrestling's a work and blah, blah, blah. But guys put their hearts into this stuff sometimes. And he really believed he made a quarter of a million dollars the year that he was champion in 1977 when the average salary, I think, was like maybe 10, 20, 15 thousand dollars a year or something. So mm-hmm. he thought like this is just the beginning and he was wrong. That was it. I mean, he never even got close to that in the year. Yeah. Yeah. And and I always saw him again growing up and having missed um, that that prime era. Uh, he was always kind of a tragic figure to me. And I think a, a lot of that. I mean, I think part of that was his health. And I think part of it was that bitterness that he carried with him because, um, you know, what I remember about Billy Graham in, uh, I guess this would have been the nineties is he was the guy who was showing up on Donahue and on all these shows, all too eager to uh, crap all over the McMahon family. And it was this love hate relationship where he'd be in, he'd be out, he'd be in, he'd be out. You know, I was there when he was inducted in the hall of fame. Mm. And, and it feels like sometime after that, he'd be on with David, Dave Meltzer, you know, spilling all the beans on the McMahons. Uh, and then they put out a DVD and a book, and and it just seemed like maybe him in particular again a, a, a lot of bitterness, some of it legitimate as you're ta- talking about because um, you know it is one of these sort of sliding doors things that you think you know what if what if Vince Jr. got that company a little bit earlier right you know how how different is all of wrestling now if they went all in on on Billy Graham and he knew that so that if you think about it from a psychological point of view it's like to get that close. And then see what happened in the 80s. And he's thinking, like, that could have been me. I could have been a part of that. Like, to get that close to it could destroy you you mentally, you know. But but he became his own worst enemy. And I'm I'm not somebody that I don't like to speak ill of the dead when somebody passes. I I, I don't want to jump on the bandwagon of talking about all the awful things they did or whatever. But he could sometimes be his own worst enemy, no question about it. And he said some really awful things over the years and he could be really polarizing. And some of that was because of the bitterness that, that he had. I mean, like, you know, he once talked about how Kofi Kingston needed to get on steroids, which is a shocking thing to think about, especially when you think about what they did to him and how he knew that. And he crusaded (laughs) against steroids. And he was here saying like, this guy's too small to be the champion. He needs to get on steroids. But I really think, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I there were issues there. There were emotional and mental issues that I think he was struggling with and demons, as they say. He would go in and out of the good graces of the McMahons and people would say to him, like, what are you doing? They took you back in like you're broke. You're penniless. They yeah. took you back in like you could be set for life. They'll they'll, they'll pay you to just show up and wave or whatever. <laughs> like, just you know what I mean? Like he could you know how many they do that with lots of people. But he just couldn't live with it. He just couldn't live with it. And he would keep kind of fluctuating back and forth depending on, you know, how he got up in in bed that morning. It could be frustrating sometimes for sure. Yeah, yeah. Incredibly sad. And again, in some ways, a a sadder figure um, than than others. So, I mean, you celebrate his life, but it's also just kind of a bummer how things worked out them. And as I touched on also, I mean, it it, it very much uh, is kind of an end of an era makes me feel a little old because – he is, and I just thought of this, he's the, the, the last world champion, WWF or WWF or world champion, whose reign was fully in the 1970s, right? Because, I mean, then he loses it to Backlund, and then Backlund kind of like straddles 70s and, and 80s era. You know, thankfully, we still have Bob Backlund, and he looks fantastic. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Bruno's gone, Pedro's gone, 
Ivan Koloff is gone. Stan Stasiak is gone. Uh, uh, Buddy Rogers. Um, and he was sort of the one of the last of that era. And now we lost him. Yeah, he was the 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 earliest living WWE champion. You know, if you want under the umbrella of all that, he was the earliest living one. And he's and he was the last one like pre national expansion. Right. So yeah, it is definitely an end of an era for sure. Well, well, Backlund's pre national expansion too, but he's the earliest. He's the earliest. He was the earliest living champion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyhow, certainly our you know a guy also who meant a lot of uh, for the wrestling magazines um, for sure. So uh, we extend our condolences uh, to to his family. Um, all right, let, let's talk a little bit about a, a very uh, busy weekend. Get Kristen into this conversation. Uh, I touched it. I mean, uh, maybe uh, uh, when people think back on this this weekend, they're not going right to uh, some of the women's title changes, but just preparing for the show today, I was sort of taken by just the, the number of them, right? So mm-hmm. we had on Saturday uh, a new SmackDown Women's Champion with Asuka beating Bianca Belair. I was pretty surprised by that. Didn't see that coming. Um, then Sunday, two women's uh, title changes uh, on uh, AEW, right, with the TBS title. I think that's the one that's probably gotten more attention uh, because, uh, you know, the, the Goldberg winning streak of, of Jade Cargill finally comes uh, to an end at the hands of Chris Statlander. Um, Tony Storm also gets the AW wins title. Again, maybe a little flukish in, in that it sounds like um, uh, Jamie Hayter was uh, injured. Um, and what else? Then that night, they they crown a new NXT Women's Champion. Uh, and last night, we get new WWE Tag Team uh, Women's Champions with uh, Shayna and, and Ronda. Is this a big coincidence? Does this speak to some kind of uh, a reset uh, in in women's wrestling where there is I don't know uh, w- was there a problem that needed to be addressed? I don't think it's I mean I I think it's a coincidence <laughs> I don't you know it's pretty hard to imagine everyone getting together or all the the planets aligning for this all to happen um, but it's cool and it's it also speaks to that there is a shakeup right so WWE NXT they got called up. Right. And for some reason, the NXT tag titles are still with uh, Alba and um, and uh, sorry, I can't, think yeah. today. I, I can't help you on that. <laughs> sorry. Isla. Sorry. Isla gone. I, yeah. It's early for me. The, it's still with them. So but I imagine at some point they'll also do something with those titles. They probably don't want to do them both at the same time. And then, of course, Indy gets up. And so then they have this tournament with all the wonderful women. I mean, they all all of them were you know, slam dunks in my <laughs> opinion. And then I was a little surprised. I think the one I was really surprised with was actually the raw title where it was Oscar winning it from Bianca. That to oh, me right. Sorry. Was, that, yeah. That to me was, it was surprising because it happened there and not at home. Um, that was a little surprising. And then for AW, it was coming, right? We knew Jade had had it for 508 days. It was coming. We were all waiting for Statlander to come back. We were all waiting for Chris to come back anyway. I thought Taya was going to be the one to get it, frankly, but she had just got there. Um, so, but this it was a surprise. And then Jamie, she was hurt. So that was also sort of expected. And I think it's just, I think it was pure luck <laughs> and awesome for women's wrestling fans. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think the, the Chris Statlander win, um, in in what was an an otherwise I don't want to say unremarkable, but but in terms of uh, it wasn't the most newsworthy AW pay per view uh, we've had relative to what they usually put out. Uh, so the next day, that was the image that I was seeing places was mm-hmm. with Chris with the title. I mean, I think it was kind of like the newsmaker coming off of of that show. So so um, uh, Brian, I know you watched the whole show. Uh, it, it's such a, a fat, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. It's such a fascinating time for AEW right now, because on one hand, you've got some of these metrics uh, coming off of the Wembley uh, show that suggest that things are are so hot right now. They could put 60,000 people in, in two days of ticket sales in a stadium. And yet, if you were focusing only on the, the U.S. metrics right now, uh, it, it almost sort of like objectively, it, it's a downtime right now for, for them. It's a weird time for the company. You, you have to think maybe... Part of it is, this is just me trying to explain it. I don't know, is is the novelty of AEW in the UK, right? I mean, um, yeah, it's kind of like the first Grand Slam. But but yeah, it's, it's weird because they don't, if you're just following them on the US side or the North American side and, and, and their ratings or their 
ticket sales and things, you're going like, this is not a company that I would imagine would sell out Wembley Stadium. Like when they first announced it, I was like, oh my God, this could be embarrassing. Why would they do this? <laughs> but, but I mean, they're doing it and it's great. So, I mean, the only explanation I could have, and, and that, this is why you get these, these like maniacs that say things like, well, Tony Khan is buying all the tickets, clearly. Yes, clearly he's <laughs> buying all the tickets in the stadium. <laughs> But this is what drives people crazy because they're trying to understand exactly what we're talking about. But I think it's the novelty of it. And uh, as I'm not the first one to say this, but they don't get a lot of major league wrestling shows over there, like big global events. And that's part of it, you know, uh, but good for them, though, because it's a good, you know, it, it's a, it's good optics. And if they put on a great show, even better, I it would I would hate for them to take the attitude of, well, we sold out the place, so who cares what we put out there? You know mm. what I mean? Like, we could just have, you know, whatever. But they should try to knock it out of the park because that's how you ensure that you can keep doing things like that, too, and you don't just kill it. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's not that even double or nothing. Like, I don't think – I think there were, like, huge empty areas of – Yeah. I, I mean, I, I forget the, the final figure, but I, I, I had heard – Close to showtime that they had sold in the neighborhood of, of 4,000 seats. There was all kinds of images on social media of diners that were giving away four free tickets with the purchase of like a hamburger or something. Um, I mean, they were they were papering the place like crazy. <laughs> well, it would seem. And then some of the pictures that, that you saw, uh, you know, where they're on the hard camera side, it looked like half that place was was empty. So. Nothing about that show, and and even putting that aside, I'd just say the buzz leading into that show. It, it this did not feel this like it had a lot of buzz going into it. Um, hard even to point to like what was the real marquee match. I mean, AEW has been very good for a long time um, of of building, building, building to that next match that you really want to see. Um, you know, I guess he had some of that here with the uh, the, the anarchy in the, in the arena match. I mean, that was the blow off to a. Uh, a big match, but but the, yeah, the product just generally feels a, a little bit cold now, and and at the same time, uh, and I don't know how much the two are are, are related. Chris, I'd be interested in, in your take. Like on one hand, it feels like um, here we are again. They're investing a lot in CM Punk, and and Punk being the one that could kind of pull them out of this. Um, on, on the other hand, it sort of feels like Punk's been a distraction, mm -hmm. and while they've been trying to settle that, have they maybe? you know, that their bot their eye been off of the ball on on the, the product that they are putting out in anticipation of the return of, of Punk. Yeah, I think I mean I can imagine he him and his team are definitely distracted by Punk. And the fans, frankly, are very distracted by Punk. And also they have just this poor pay pay-per-view cycle recently and the stories aren't connecting. And there's either some that are going way too long in my opinion or there's some that just started and weren't built up at all. And so in some cases, I wouldn't say every single match, it felt like an important dynamite. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people say, well, okay, the high price, high price tags for Memorial Day could also be to blame. The travel, um, everybody, you know, it's such a weird place to put a pay-per-view personally. And But the matches were too long. I mean, the matches are too long. Um, you know, in my opinion, JR made some like crazy uh, comments that sort of took me out of out of the show. But I think I think yeah, I think there's this distraction by Punk. Um, there's announcements of announcements of announcements, yep. and it's really hard <laughs> to focus on your pay per views. And there's a lot coming up. There's quite a f there's quite a few. I mean, All In is what a week before All Out. I mean, I is that official I mean, now? I don't. I don't. That know. is just Typically. weird. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, they need to. I mean, I wish they would just do something and just figure it out, announce it, so that we can move on. Yeah, yeah it it feels like um, a, a lot of AEW's kind of worst habits that have have always been there have really been kind of rising to the surface in in the last uh, a few weeks, and maybe it is product of, of that distraction. But you know, you just touched on it, uh, uh, Kristen. Um, you know, some I, I think lack of discipline on mm -hmm. on Double or Nothing, where. We've talked about this, Brian, a, a, a little kind of indie in that everybody gets, a, 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 you know, 15, 20 minutes. Everybody, you know, does everything in their match. I mean, it just feels like that th they weren't holding back anything from from the, the, the first match. And it just, you know, you get a lot of sameness among the matches, uh, a, a lot of overbooking, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the, the AEW's worst hits, you know. 
Yeah, I think that that's it in a nutshell. The way you just put it is exactly kind of what I would have said. But because it's like, you know, I watched it, like I said, from beginning to end. And I watched it. This is the thing. I watched it with people who are big AEW fans and they get all their, their pay-per-views. They, they actually got me out of my house to go over their house <laughs> to watch this thing. And I usually love AEW's pay-per-views, even when I don't always love their weekly television. I always go, you know what? Their pay-per-views are typically home runs. We've even talked about it here. Just amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. And even with the crowd I was in, I know it's anecdotal and everything. People were checking out. People were getting bored to a degree that they usually don't. You have to, you know, there's the sameness, like you said, every match. Okay, here we go. Another 25 minutes <laughs> of 45 near falls. And it's everybody doing their... It's it's almost it's one of my criticisms sometimes of New Japan, which is mm -hmm. why I, I sometimes have trouble watching their stuff because it's like throw everything at the wall. Every match is World War Three from beginning to end, and I and I feel like they're copying some of that. And I know it sounds counterintuitive because that sounds like hey, that would be great, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's not. You have to like bring it up, bring it down, have a different kind of match here, a different kind of finish here, have like a total goofball thing happening here, like. I feel like that's one of the things that WWE actually gets right. Like, yeah. you know, I, I'm as uncomfortable as the next person with these Saudi shows. And I don't like that they do business there. And the only reason I watch them now is because, you know, it's it's for work reasons that, although, you know, but I, but I've got to say the, the night of champions was a dynamite show. It was, I, well, that's the wrong word to use. <laughs> it was, it was a good show. I thought it was an entertaining it was a collision show from beginning to end it was good it held my attention there was good stuff there was you know back and forth up and down and they're on a roll i mean what what's and the last bad that. wwe pay-per-view i mean you, you've got to go back a, a long time i mean wwe has been clicking for a while now and i do think that they've sort of figured out that that pay-per-view premium live event formula um that, that you're talking about so i mean i i think like most of us agree that the AEW product is has got some some issues right now. I think there's a lack of enthusiasm um, right now. There's some distractions in the way of CM Punk and and some other things. Is this the time, Kristen, to be launching another show, another two hour <laughs> show, uh, a Saturday night? It just it it just feels odd that they would. And, and look, you're not going to turn down the money from from Warner Brothers Media if they're if they're offering it. Right. Um. But but taking all this and uh, ostensibly um doing a roster split in the middle of it, uh, it just. Uh, it, it, it's and and look, you give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, uh, maybe the the uh, the brain trust over there can can figure it out. But it, it certainly doesn't seem like the ideal time to be going forward with something like that. Yeah, I mean, I've never been one to. I mean, I know it's it's happened in the past, right? Where where wrestling shows have fallen on Saturday nights. I think it's a really weird time slot. I mean, sure, there's probably going to be some people who use that as like let's go to Collision for date night. But I just find it so weird. I, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Um, and then you think about, you know, college football, <laughs> like yeah. all these sports in the future that are going to just, I'm sorry, they're going to outrun AW. And yes, I think right now it's such a terrible time to be doing this show because it is obviously revolved around, like we said, this CM Punk stuff. So people are not focused on your shows you have. They're focused on this, this drama. And, and personally, <laughs> now this is just me. I wish they would focus on other things like women's wrestling, for instance, or I don't know, these pay-per-views that are happening like in a month or so. Yeah. That's like, there's not been any matches, right. That have been confirmed. I mean, that seems nuts. And, and yes, double or nothing just happened, but it's like, okay, you know how have like a month to figure out these stories. And, and we saw it with double or nothing because that card was not clear until right. the, the last week or so. So, so I don't, I mean, I think what you're saying is spot on because it just happened. I mean, that's, right. that's what we just saw with Double or Nothing. Yeah. Right. And I yeah. understand why people don't like the YouTube shows because it is just a squash fest, you know, that's all it is. But I, I really liked it because it did give a lot of people, a lot of AW fans, mm -hmm. um, access to indie wrestlers that they may not have known about. And it did lead to a few signings. So um, it just would have been easy, uh, in my opinion, just to do a block taping and then just let that happen instead of starting this new thing. But then again, I, I don't know anything about, you know, TV rights or or those sort of deals. Maybe maybe Warner Brothers was like, nope, got to happen now. I just think it's a weird time to be doing this.
Yeah, I mean, and we've seen it certainly on, on WWE side, and, and uh, there's a little bit of a, of a story recently about this, about maybe, I think somebody asked uh, uh, Nick Khan about SmackDown potentially adding a, a third hour, and he seemed to suggest that it, it's a possibility. And and I mean, the, again, the point being that, you know, these these TV companies, um, they, they call the shots, and if they want more content, you give them more content because they're signing the checks. And it, it's not necessarily what is best for, for the product, but, you know, the, the TV executive in that boardroom isn't thinking about storyline pacing or thinning out your roster too much or anything right. like that. They're just thinking, well, if we do this well with, Two hours, let's add a third hour, and then and they're not wrong in that um you can get pretty good viewership relative to what else might be on uh at that time, but it's not necessarily what's good for the product. Um let, let's switch over to WWE. Uh, uh, Brian, you started to talk about it. I, I really enjoyed uh, the show too. I think they're they're kind of on a roll. Um I uh I guess a couple of uh, big uh, headlines. Why don't we start with the new uh, world heavyweight uh, championship? Uh, a fine match uh, between Seth and AJ. You know. This isn't going down match of the year, but it was what you'd expect out of these two guys. And also, as you'd expect, Seth is now the world heavyweight champion. Um, are you feeling any better about the creation of, of this new title? It, it's funny that even the wrestlers themselves and some interviews and stuff, um, it, it feels like even they can't sell it with a straight face. That, that <laughs> this thing, you know, is, is worth the same as what Roman's got around his waist. It's strange because you're going like, okay, so now there's three world titles and one guy has two. And like, if he's had two for a year and a half now, why isn't it just one? Like, why, why wouldn't you just take one off him? I, there's all these questions. It'd be easier at the airport, right? Right. (laughs) (laughs) But I think. You know, it's starting. Uh, this is just wild speculation on my part, but you asked if I felt any better about it. I do feel the tiniest bit better because I'm starting to get a sense of what I think. And this is again, if the booking makes sense, which is always a huge assumption to make. <laughs> but what I think they they may be trying to do here, and this sounds wild to me, but the way they've been stressing, they've been st- uh, stressing the historical nature of this title which is still kind of confusing because i guess it's supposed to be the old world heavyweight title that they deactivated like 10 years ago because they've been like hinting at that here and there like with triple h's history with it and even the design of the belt like it has the shape of the old big gold belt but then it has all these elements on it of like i don't like it I I think it's gorgeous. Really? I think it's too busy. It has the winged eagle. It has the Bruno San Martino crown on the top. It has the McMahon family crest. Like, it has all these things going on. And and they were really selling it at the show, like, how important it is. It got me starting to think that the end game of this could be that this belt is going to eventually become the primary main belt. And the way you would do that is – you would have another unification. You would have maybe Seth versus Roman, who knows, with the belts becoming unified. And then the other two, the Universal and the WWE Championship belt kind of get phased out and and this belt becomes the belt. Um, That might be the only justification for even doing any of this. The only thing that makes sense. I mean, it's a natural match, Seth versus Roman. We've seen it before, but it was sort of, if you, if I remember right, I think it ended in like a disqualification. It's yeah, not it was like the Rumble. Was it this year's Rumble or last right, year's? You Rumble? had yeah. a DQ, which is so rare in those big matches these days. But, you know, like that, I, I just started to get a weird sense like they may have some type of a long term goal here which is why they did this because otherwise it makes no sense because like we've said a million times they could try all they want but it just comes across like this is the consolation prize like you know if it from a kayfabe point of view it comes across like well nobody could beat roman so i guess we'll just have this other belt that other people could (laughs) wrestle for like in storyline who would want that belt (laughs) why would you want it because it's like you're saying well I can't beat the real world champion. So thank you for giving me this. I feel so good about it. It's <laughs> but I very think, hard to, to fight that perception. And and I think that's precisely what it is. I mean, and and so I, I don't think that there's a, a, a bigger picture here. You know, I do think they'll do Roman versus Seth. I could see them um, doing it the Survivor Series, right? If they go back to uh, the, the, the that formula of one brand versus the other brand, that's where you could have Survivor Series, uh, Seth and, and Roman. Um, 
without the titles on the line as they did in past years when they had the two champions wrestle each other and Roman wins. And I think that's, I, I kind of feel like it's that clear, you know, um, and, and, and that's kind of that, you know, uh, and then the next night Seth is, if it's still Seth by then, um, defending the title on raw. I mean, I, I do think that it is the second ter- dairy title. And um, I don't know if I want to say in WWE's defense, but I, I understand from their point of view is I, I think they look at, and this kind of goes back to the Billy Graham discussion. Um, I, I think they want Roman not only to be uh, considered, you know, the, the best of right now, or even the best of the modern generation. I, I, I think that triple H in particular um, the the goal here is to to get him on that Mount Rushmore, right? To get him in that conversation of of the greatest of all time. I think that's what's behind that, you know, one one thousand day reign, and because that puts him in that conversation um, among that group. And you know, we've heard stories about them wanting to uh, reset some of these records and some of these history uh, uh, books because so much of them are concentrated forty years ago. Uh, I don't know what point Gunther's going to surpass Honky Tonk, but I would count on them wanting to do that too, right? They had uh, the the Usos uh, get the longest uh, tag team title reign. You know, I think they want to start getting the modern era in in that conversation of these are the greatest uh, ever. So, you know, I don't know that when when Roman didn't beat Cody at WrestleMania this year, again, my my mind immediately went to okay, so they'll do it next year at WrestleMania. I don't know that they they don't do the rematch next year at WrestleMania and Roman beats him uh, again <laughs> and they just keep going and going and going and going and and, and maybe there is no end in sight. Maybe they just kind of ride it until the wheels fall off. Uh, I, I'm the, not the problem sure. the problem is, and I'm all for breaking the records and all that. And look, because in the '90s they started moving towards doing shorter reigns, and that's why everything, like you said, all these records are so old because the booking philosophies changed, you know, no one's going to hold a belt for more than like six to nine months. Like they went years and years like that. Yeah. And so, you know, now they're trying to change it, but it's like, can we maybe do it with a popular baby face that people <laughs> want to see win? Like, could we, could we maybe try that? Because I think people eventually get burned out. They get burned out. Like I love Roman. I think he's amazing. And I love the fact that he's been such a dominant champ, but you know, people will say things to me like, well, what about Ric Flair? And he held the title forever and blah, blah, and Harley Race and kept, you know, winning it. Yeah, but they kept losing it and getting it back because you were trying to give people hope. Like none of, none, not a single one of Ric Flair's title reigns because he held it from like basically like 81 to like 91, right? He was NWA champion, but he lost it and won it seven times in that period and not a single reign that he had lasted as long as Roman Reigns title reign but you it need, is a very, you need to give people hope yeah if you're doing that right and and i think that's one of the issues that you run into is that and and, and this is inevitable in wrestling is that you see a wrestling company a wrestler do something and you try to sort of like match it up with when it's been done before like all right well if you're doing this the way you do it is the way they did it with this guy then and and I do think that maybe to some extent they're trying to do something with Roman that's never been done, uh, which okay. is uh, uh, as you touched on almost you know Hulk Hogan in the eighties but with a heel right who who is an, an absolute killer and uh, really generational isn't even enough I mean you're, you're uh, and this is me just putting him over but I think what they're going for is. The greatest of of all time, you know. Well, it's the longest heel world title reign in company history for sure. It's the longest heel world title reign for any company since probably the seventies. I mean, it's like astronomical at this point. So maybe they are great. trying to do that. Then he's and great, he's great, 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 great. And and I do think a lot of these uh, things that that people complain about, myself included. He's not around that much. We don't seem to defend that title that much. I do think it's working. I do think it 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 makes. Um, uh, it, it gives him an, an aura that he wouldn't have if he was out there every week um, defending. You know, they just announced yesterday uh, nine dates or something that that Roman is working this summer. And I know me as a fan, I went right to them. And I'm like, oh, is he coming around? When's the last time, like, you know, you did that for anybody? Like, is, is the star coming to town? He has that kind of aura that they have. And I don't know that even John Cena had it, which is the closest thing. Roman Reigns is a big, big, big deal. And... um. Deservedly so, in that I think he's delivering in in the biggest way. I mean, every time 
you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm reluctant to come off like a fanboy, but the guy walks into the, the ring and and uh, just the presence. I, I just think he's knocking everything out of the park. Yeah. Th- that said, uh, you know, I am surprised to see this bloodline thing just keep on being strung along and strung along. Uh, it, it has. And every time I think this is kind of dead, you know, we got to kind of turn the page. They, there is a new wrinkle uh, in it. Uh, Chris, and I'll ask you, you know, the, the latest development now with with Jimmy Uso ostensibly turning on on roman i mean and 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 now there's questions i again i love some of the nuance of this that that jimmy was like the company guy he was the soldier jay was the one that was on the fence now they've kind of switched roles jimmy was more decisive than jay ever was and saying i'm out and now jay's got to decide between his brother and the, and the bloodline uh i mean it is it is complex storytelling and i think it it's really working and there's also part of me that you know, is mindful of like that expiration date on the milk carton and are they, they, are they pushing it a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think the soap opera-ness, right. The drama of it is sort of saving, at least for me, the staleness of Roman being champ or the Usos that used to be champs or it's saving it for me because um, I, I'm one of those that, okay, like a thousand days, like, come on, you know, like I will get stale. Um, so it's saving it for me. And I think Zayn and Owens are their own really entertaining pair. And they had so much history so that when they finally got together, that was a big deal. Um, I, I'm i glad the Usos are getting sick of Roman. I mean, that's great, right, that they're all turning on him. Because, you know, it's pretty clear that, at least in character, right, Roman doesn't really care about anyone but himself. And so um, I, I also am glad because I feel like, eventually the Usos have to separate themselves if they if they want to continue to be um, standing tall as a tag team. I feel like eventually that has to separate because Roman eventually has to have like a real feud, in my opinion. Like if you continue to have him just squashing people until the end of time, I don't know that people are going to be really all that interested. They're, at least on my timeline, they're not. Like they're just done with it. Like can we just be done? Um, so I like the drama part of it. And for a while, I was like, so tired of this. And then they had the Jay, they had the Sammy thing, and all that was, it brought me back in. And that's sort of when done right, WWE's, um, their, their shtick, right? That's their, their specialty. Yeah. What What do you guys see as, you know, where this is going in, in um, I guess, more the near term than the long term? But I Roman's working uh, Money in the Bank, I believe they've said. I'm sure he's working SummerSlam. He, he's got to keep busy until um i guess you get back to cody whenever that is uh, i don't think it's SummerSlam. i mean i i do think they're more on pace to doing it at wrestlemania than at SummerSlam. and clearly it is still very much about the bloodline and the dissension in the bloodline it does seem like uh and even just coming off a of raw last night and uh, uh zane and and owens uh i guess now moving into a program with imperium it does feel like they have finally turned that page and now um, at least for the near future, Sammy and Kevin have moved on and they're not part of that storyline. You're still left with the dissension in the storyline. What does that mean in the next several months? I mean, I thought they, the the, um, uh, the match they did in Saudi Arabia uh, with Solo and Roman going for the tag title was was a nice new wrinkle and, I, and, and it was organic and it felt like a main event and it's not something that you saw coming right away. Um, but is it, you know, do we now move into Roman versus Jimmy? Roman versus Jay, Roman versus Solo, mm. um, is you know is the is the bloodline over and now he just starts kind of picking away at them one by one. What I think is what I love about it is the patience they're showing. So that's good. I mean, I I, I feel like because you're talking about how they just keep it fresh and keep it compelling and keep you wondering. They don't rush into things. I think that's a good thing. It feels like finally after twenty years. They may finally be getting over like the Russo style of attitude era, like crash TV booking where we got to have 47 heel turns in a month and the title changes every other day. Like they're finally starting to maybe say, okay, let's like take our time a little bit with this and like, let you know, let these things like work out and let, keep people guessing. That's good. I, I want to point out one thing, which I, which I loved. It's a little thing. These little things they do is if you, if anyone noticed this, when Jimmy did his turn and, and Jay is like freaked out, like, what did you just do when he's super kicking Roman multiple times? Jay is shouting out. 
he's not saying Roman. He's saying Joe. I don't know if anybody heard that. Oh, really? No. He's screaming as Jimmy is pulling him away up the ramp. He's screaming like concern, like Joe, Joe, <laughs> which is his shoot name, which mm-hmm. is like it, it makes the fans go like, oh, my God, like, wow, what's happening? It's almost like that old school thing of like, is this real? Is there something real <laughs> happening here? Like, even though we know it's not like it adds that layer of reality, like he's calling him by his real name. Like, that's a cool thing. But yeah. but one thing they could have done to maybe add, and I try not to do the fantasy booking thing, but like to add a little juice and maybe get something going again, it's an old school move. But like in that tag match, if you had Roman be the one who got pinned, I mean, They're that would be doing that. <laughs> but that would I know people be said that, but I'm like, nope, huge. No yeah. There's no title changes. And now you put the thought in people's heads, especially if it's Sammy or, you know, like, oh my God, he just pinned Roman Reigns. And then you have the title match where Roman wins. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. what does he really lose there? But otherwise, like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, everybody always talks about how this is all building towards Roman versus Jey Uso. And I, I don't know. I don't know if I see it. Like, I think it might, but I, I also, right now, don't think that is necessarily the um the, the destination i think it is a match that they do and i think maybe roman just beats him in that match um you know or, or, unless it you know the the payoff is further out even past wrestlemania even past roman um and and cody and i think we've talked about it i think you can eventually do roman and and jay in a marquee match without the title on the line uh once roman's already lost that title and then have jay when I, I i i've said this a lot but but uh to me th- this entire storyline which is one of the great storylines in, in WWE history uh jay is the mvp i think he's um he's just so fantastic uh and and not that i i think the Usos are so much fun and, and i'm happy for them to stay together but I do see something special in Jay that I would like to see um, explored and, and carried out. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope something is in in, in uh, Jay's future. Um, yeah. uh, what else? Let's talk a, a, a bit more about the, the two women's uh, matches. Um, you know, one was essentially a squash, uh, Kristen, with, with yeah. Rhea and, and Natty on Natty's birthday. And she what, she beat her in, what, 90 seconds, something like oh that. God, yeah. um, and uh, pretty decisive. I'm sure there were people who weren't happy about it. Uh, but, but you know, just going from from the commentators, I think it was Corey that said she's she said she's she's the, the, the best talent in WWE right now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, maybe making something of a comparison, it, it does feel like, they they've got something special planned for Rhea. They don't see her as the flavor of the week. They they see her as something more. Yeah, no, she's definitely being pushed to the moon, um, and rightfully so. I mean, she's pretty dominant. She's imposing, um, posing nature. So, um, I mean, it's no surprise that I mean I didn't expect Natalia to win, and I think Natalia is an important like centerpiece for the women's division. She's really there to bring up the next woman and to help her and to make her look good. And I don't, I don't know Natalia, but I don't think she really has an issue with that. And she's been around forever. It'd be cool to see Natalia have another reign, but I think she's, I mean, in my opinion, I think she's probably happy there. And I, I love, I love Natalia. I think she does what she does really well. Um, But to think that she's going to defeat Ridley is kind of just ridiculous. And I think a squash is the right, uh, it's the right move here. There wasn't much buildup, and that's okay too. I mean, Rhea needs to look really, really strong. Um, there was some some time before she even won the title that was like, "What's going on here?" But yeah, no, they're pushing her to the moon in the way that they push Bianca quite a bit. And I'm I'm happy with it. She deserves it. Yeah, I mean that's that's just the reality of of the role Natty's going to play um, at at this stage of her career. Uh, yeah, and I think. It, I agree. I imagine Natty was 100% fine with it, uh, too, even and coming you, on, on her birthday. And you need to have matches like that sometimes, yeah. I think. Like we were just talking about, you got to have matches like that sometimes. Just shake things up. Vary it. Like People still talk about when Brock squashed John Cena at SummerSlam because mm-hmm. you don't see that kind of thing. Like It makes a statement. And and making a statement, speaking of that, I just have to say, I have to point out, and I tweeted about this, how much I love the fact, I mean, 
I've never met Rhea Ripley. I have a feeling like I would get along with her very well because I like her attitude about things. She came out. If you think about like the whole thing with these shows in, in Saudi Arabia where the women have to be covered from head to toe, you can't show your elbow because God forbid somebody might get excited in the audience or whatever. So so she came out and she said, you know what? I can't. OK, I have to be totally covered. I can't show my body. So she comes out in fetish gear from neck to feet. <laughs> <laughs> it, almost even more subversive right. than if she had come out in her typical gear. And I do not think that that was unintentional. So I kind of liked that kind of like subversive attitude that she yeah. has. I enjoy it very much the way that she kind of threw that back at them. Yeah. yeah. The, the other uh, a key women's match coming off of uh, Saturday, maybe the one with, with the most uh, attention was uh, uh, Becky and, uh, Trish Stratus. And I got to say, I mean, I've just been blown away by, by Trish, right? I mean, I remember going into a uh, WrestleMania where they did the, uh, the six woman tag and, and Lita having been more um, active in the last few years, in the last few months and bringing Trish back. I thought Trish was going to be really the, the weak link of, of that uh, match. And Trish looked really good at WrestleMania and has continued to look good. And um, you know, she's really kind of turned back the, the hands of time and is is doing really good work, I think, uh, as a heel. I don't know where it goes, how far they can go with it, uh, but I think they've got something with with Trish. Yeah, I mean, the feud itself never grabbed me. And I, I don't know. I've never really watched the history of Trish. I want to, but I've never seen heel Trish, which I guess for, you know, that the fans of that era, that was a big deal that she turned heel. I I never really got into this 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 feud. And as much as Trish is great... I'm not in love with the fact that she is in this longish story feud when there's so many other women um, who are on the roster who are just begging for a chance. And that's WWE thing. They bring back, right? They bring back the, the legends. They bring back those faces because they do put people in seats. But I just thought if you're going to do Trish Stratus and you're going to do Becky Lynch, who are two incredible wrestlers, then you should do something real and not this sort of, shallow idea of a story so the the thing for this match and again i did not watch it i mean i didn't watch it that's personal but um what i did see that really stood out to me in this match what really is me for the highlight is that zoe stark came up mm -hmm. and interfered for trish and you know she's heel now and i never really ever considered zoe stark a heel but I, she she seems to be really good at it and i'm interested to see where it goes and and hopefully this pushes stark to a new level yeah, I, I think what you touched on is one of the things they're doing is, you know, WWE has um, uh, always relied on on bringing back these legends um, and and putting them in position to help draw money now with their current stars. And frankly, their ability to do it on the women's side has always been very limited. Um, so they they do go back to to Lita and, and Trish a lot. I mean, the, the women who have been around now close to 20 years mm -hmm. and still have a little uh, gas left in the tank, but usually it is the, that kind of like special attraction thing. So it's interesting to see them, um, you know, go all in with Trish with a, a, a storyline. Now maybe kind of an alliance with Zoe Stark, a new character. It, it doesn't feel like uh, the special attraction. It feels like she's part of the roster now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how, how long um, they're going to uh, do that, but Trish looks really good. I'm, I'm happy to see it. Um, oh, what else coming off of, you know, we touched on it a little bit, but, but uh, you were surprised. I was surprised to see uh, Bianca lose the title uh, against Asuka. Um, you know, that was a year plus uh, reign as well. D do you make much of it? Bianca hasn't exactly been setting the world on fire uh, the last few months. Um, mm -hmm. So does this maybe freshen it up? Do you worry at all that it might suggest uh, losing a little confidence in her? I don't think they're losing confidence. I think they need to shake it up and not to say anything to Bianca. She's great, but I do think her star is starting to dim a little bit. Yeah. Um, she, they, she hasn't been giving, given a ton of new feuds. Um, I know last year when we looked at ranking everyone, a lot of her shows were super, like they were live shows, right? So there hasn't been a lot of movement um, on, on the main at all for her. And when it was, it was Asuka. And I think, they protected her really well in this match. Um, Asuka's chaotic, right? She's got mist everywhere, some on her hands, some not. And in my opinion, it protected Bianca. And we needed a new champ. We don't want Bianca to get stale. 
because eventually, um, you know, there are Bianca super, super fans, right? But eventually um, we are going to get, okay, this is getting a little stale. And it's not to say anything against Bianca, but I, I do think we need a little freshen up. And and Rhea's really sort of taken the spotlight as far as the women's titles go over there. And so, yeah, I mean, and if you're going to lose it, lose it to Asuka, right? She's, you know, she's incredible and she's historic and she's got these huge, huge, like, lengths of experience. So it's not like Bianca lost it to, you know, rookie number 101 or something. This is Asuka. And I think they could even continue this feud. And that's the great part, too, is that it'll keep yeah. Bianca in the conversation. Yeah. I also think that Asuka needed it, too, because yeah. it's like, especially if you want to commit and be serious about this kind of like repackaging of her and repositioning of her. She already lost at Mania, right? Is that what I'm thinking of? She lost. Yes. So I think she had she has to win at some point. Yeah. Otherwise, it becomes a joke like, oh, this is not, you know, this is not mm -hmm. a, someone to be taken seriously. Like, I think she needed this, especially. Yeah. Bianca's fine. She's going to be fine. Yeah. But Asuka needed this more. So I think it yeah. was the right thing. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, that could also be said for the other marquee match um, on, on the show. That was Brock and, and Cody following kind of a, a similar similar formula. Cody beat him. If you want to keep this going at some point, Brock's got to, you know, unless you're going to kill him dead. It it, it made sense that, that Brock um, won this one. And uh, ostensibly, they do it again. I don't know if it's at Money in the Bank at, at SummerSlam, but for, for all the marbles, high stakes... You know, I don't know how much I'm loving this whole thing, and I think part of it, uh, uh, Brian, uh, is still a little WrestleMania hangover. And and I and I and I've heard other people bring this up. Everything we've seen with with Cody and Brock, and even with Roman and the Bloodline, and him teaming with Solo against the Tag Team Championship, it feels like you could have done you could have done all of this with Cody as the champion, right? And and Correct. in some ways, it almost makes more sense. This was Cody's, like, world title feud to have. Like, yeah, now I'm the yeah. champion. And without it, I don't know, something's missing. And, I mean, and I now Brock, gonna... right, I'm the champion, and now Brock Lesnar's coming to destroy me and take it, makes so much more sense than this whole thing of, like, well, I'm the guy who lost at WrestleMania, and Brock Lesnar's really jealous of that spot that I'm in, that I'm the guy that just lost at WrestleMania. Like, it doesn't make any <laughs> sense... And the only help, hope of it is to, to keep Cody strong. So I'm not a fan of this 50-50 booking style. Like, oh, no. so you get a win, and now I get a win. And now you win, and now I win. I think the purpose of this feud is Cody needs to come out of it strong. Like, like Again, Brock has been around since the dawn of time at this point. We know he's dominant. He could beat anybody, blah, 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 blah. This is the point where he, he puts – Cody Rhodes over strong because that's that's the future. That's what you're trying to build on. So, again, I've been very trepidatious watching this feud play out because now he's lost this match, and they could say whatever they want. Well, I didn't tap out. I pet yeah, he lost. He's got, to, he's got to come out of the feud overall as the winner. So, again, the only way this makes sense is if they do the rubber match and he wins, and he wins decisively, not like – Oh, I fell on top of you and you couldn't <laughs> get up, but, but, but like wins. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, again, like we said from WrestleMania, like wait and see with Cody. Otherwise, we see the writing on the wall, which is that they don't want Cody to be a top guy uh, uh, because otherwise, what's the point of this? It, it, it's you get to see what their long term thinking is. So, like, personally, I wouldn't have had him lose at all just because I feel like. Cody is always on. I always I have that AEW post traumatic like stress <laughs> of like the crowd is always this close from turning on him if he looks yeah. weak or lame or whatever. So why would you do that, especially when Brock already Brock is already the kind of heel that people cheer for? You have to be so careful because it even seemed like in Saudi Arabia that the crowd was starting to turn and go with Brock and like yeah. you, you don't want that or maybe that is what they want. I don't know, but it just it just like you said, it all feels so wrong and off what they're doing with him. It's very bizarre. This broken arm thing. Like, I understand. I, yeah. I, I get it. It's like we're trying to duplicate what we did with the peck. And, like, we're trying to make it look like he's struggling and he's got to overcome these obstacles. Okay. But he lost. So, like. Right. If, but I think if, that's why they did it right. I mean, I think it was a storyline device to. 
maybe cover up for the loss a little bit because he's got that out. You know, he lost, but he lost to the, you know, the toughest guy in all of wrestling and with one arm. And I understand that it's wrestling and, you know, this this is what we do. Wrestling's a work. But I have to say the broken arm, this thing, it does – kind of put a blemish on just the amazingness of what he did with that real injury that I felt like that was the moment that made him forever. And this is sort of like, it's like, a, it feels know. like they're making it harder than it needs to be. for, for Yes. Right? Yes. The stupid thing I keep hearing, he's got to struggle. He's got to overcome. Like <laughs> how much, how much does but now we're in overcome? this? But, but now he lost at WrestleMania. So, so, so <laughs> now you, you do have to figure out, how to get back there um you know so so it's not even money morning quarterbacking because we all thought he should win at wrestlemania uh, uh but but now you you've got to figure it out and and you know as, as we touched on i think the reason one of the things that makes me more uneasy uh, of it is that we saw in AEW what could happen when cody overstays his welcome a little bit right you know so no, i was he there is a, with that. A, with that yeah, crowd, it, that Queen's he's a crowd, delicate that guy him. to 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 book, you know, um, be, because he is so much that traditional babyface kind of saccharine, and um, <laughs> without being really protected, fans can turn on him, and you know, it it's sensitive. You got to be really really careful, and I, I and and we got to it, it, again. If I don't think it's SummerSlam anymore. I mean, do you agree? I don't. It, to to me, we're going to be at SummerSlam. SummerSlam's whatever, six weeks away, something like that. We're going to be here uh, before you know it. Uh, so he is not wrestling Roman Reigns and winning the world title at SummerSlam. So I would guess they're doing it again at, at WrestleMania. That's always what made sense to me. But that is such a long way to go, you know, to keep this going. It makes no sense. I don't know. I don't know what the plan is. They still have a lot of time for SummerSlam, but there's been no indication of, of really anything as far as what they're going to yeah, do. Yeah, I, I think SummerSlam is is uh, something related to the bloodline, right? Um, and I could see the the Cody Brock blow off there, so maybe they they skip Money in the Bank. Uh, maybe he have, have have is is he even in the mix for the Money in the Bank uh, match? I don't know. They've done a couple of those qualifiers, and I don't. I don't think they've revealed who's in all of them, have they? I yeah. Don't know if I... No, Ricochet got in one of them, right? I mean, no, uh... no, he lost. Uh, Did he lose? No, I'm sorry. No, he won. <laughs> That's how yeah. memorable it was. He he beat <laughs> the Miz. He qualified, and then they had another qualifier. I can't remember who it was. Um, they had two qualifiers on Raw. Yeah. Yeah, but it's all to say, yeah, like it. It it does feel like um, the return to Cody and and Roman is way out in the distance for one thing they're on two different brands so you need some kind of storyline device for them to be uh, reunited in the ring and and i don't think it's happening anytime soon um anything else i mean i i think it pretty much covers it um uh, a few major shows i didn't see nxt did you guys watch nxt i watched part of it yeah. during double or nothing's like slow response <laughs> yeah <laughs> like the cole and jericho match i was like okay yeah yeah I, yeah I watched a little bit of it um Obviously, the Die Jack and Ilya match is something you want to go back and watch. It's pretty okay. brutal. Um, and then the NXT uh, women's title match. I am all Tiffany Stratton now. Don't get me wrong. I love Lyra. Um, I've been following her since NXT UK days. She's got the experience under her belt. So there, in my opinion, there's nobody else that should have been paired with Tiffany in there. But I am Stratton all the way. She really changed my mind about her. And um, the fact that she's hungry and she's willing to, to really... Um, train and i'm i'm excited to see what happens with her but i think it was the right choice yeah, yeah. so yeah. it was a good show um i'm I, i'm a super fan of nxt uk and they're using so many of the nxt uk people um the heritage cup thing is huge i love noem dar um that was a really cool match so and it's it's six matches or something like that five or six matches as opposed to 12 so right it's something that if you have time, you should go back and watch. And a little bit of kind of the return of the the what was the Wednesday Night War with NXT versus uh, <laughs> AEW. So what do you guys think of of weekends like this, which when it's just like wrestling show on top of wrestling show on top of wrestling show? I know on one hand, on top of a holiday weekend, and people have got commitments and things like that. Uh, but I enjoy it. I mean, you don't want it every week, but but it yeah. is fun to to just have a, a bunch of wrestling to watch over a weekend. Yeah, I mean, I like it. I mean, it, it also just 
gets it out of the way on one weekend <laughs> yeah, yeah. instead of every <laughs> single weekend. Wrestling. I don't yeah. have to cover it all, though. I can imagine the people who have to sit there and cover the, the shows. <laughs> yeah, Brian, I know. Uh, I, like my fiance Warren, I mean, to, to write all those notes and to keep track of everything, that's that's a nightmare. So sending love to those people. <laughs> yeah, it's like this weird love-hate thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love wrestling and I love, you know, a good show. At the, but then as these weekends approach, I just go like, well... I'm not getting any sleep this weekend. I guess I'll make it up during, I'll take an afternoon nap or something because uh, yeah, with the wrestling news and, you know, now and then I'll lean on Mike Sempervivi, you know, but, but like Mike does, he's the anchor. So he's doing the recording and the producing. So I don't want to be like, Oh, by the way, could you also like write it too? You know, I can't do that. So those weekends, I mean, I love it. And like I've said to Al, if I didn't love it, I would be like, I'm not doing this, but right. because I love it and you do what you love, it's like, all right, I'll do it. If, if it was, if it was about, you know, plastics or like patio <laughs> furniture that I was writing about, then I'd probably want to like jump <laughs> off the roof. But because it's yeah. something that I truly love, it makes you, it motivates you to push through and do it because yeah. you love it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't mind. I mean, I, you don't want it every week, but sometimes it's fun when you've got two screens going at the same time because right. two big shows are going on. Right. And... My wife will come in and be like, oh, it's one of those nights. So I, got, <laughs> yeah. I got the, I got the yeah. TV going. I got the laptop over here. I'm right. like yeah. going back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the other kind of fun part is that, that, you know, it it is fun seeing some competition uh, between wrestling companies, and uh, it, it can seem petty, you know, to put on a, a show. This goes back to the days of WrestleMania four, right? And and uh, was it Starcade and and Survivor Series, or even yes, Survivor Series? I was going to yeah, say. yeah. Um, but also, you know, now in in the age of social media, it is interesting seeing some of that warring and the little kind of. Uh, attention and what kind of numbers did nxt do versus what kind of numbers AEW did and i love um, how i love how wwe did, like Shawn michaels or or triple h they'll always go like well we didn't we're not this was not intentional right we're just, <laughs> yeah. we're yeah. just you know uh, they, they do this little dance and you know that's what they're doing you know yeah, they're like yeah. as soon as the cameras are off they're just getting a yeah. chuckle out of it you even yeah. had uh, uh, Max Caster, right, Men- uh, mentioning uh, Dominic and in- his rap, and then Rhea oh, kind so of firing great. back on on social media. So, that was great. Uh, yeah. yeah, some Love fun it. stuff. Yes. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, before we head out, uh, uh, Kristen, why don't you tell people where they can follow your stuff? Tell them uh, more about uh, Bell to Bell. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get that right one day. Well, you can find me at Kristen Ashley. Um, I am slowly getting back into Bell to Bell stuff. I've I've had to find a full time job, so life has kind of gotten in the way, but. We've got some really cool interviews coming up with people who um, like we're just in love with. And then, of course, PWI. I have a, a monthly column sometimes there. Um, and then, of course, list season, which all of us are a part yeah, of. And you and so I got – uh, we've been going through poll questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. And I know yeah. Kevin hates list season, but um, – yeah, that, yeah, that's always the marquee for me. Yeah, right. Yep. I mean, I feel like we just wrapped up, and and here we are again. Yeah, well, I guess <laughs> we're gonna have to sit down and talk Peter by five hundred within the next few weeks. I mean, I'd be surprised if yeah. maybe we don't get an email by the end of the week about yeah. you know sitting down and Very talking soon. about this. So here we go. <laughs> um, how about you, Brian? Um, where, where are you with the uh, the new book? There's well, two new books, right? There's a superhero book, and now you're yeah, now the you're superhero to book, which is non wrestling, but it's out. It's available now. Superheroes: The History of a Pop Culture Phenomenon from Ant Man to Zorro. So oh. that's out now. But the but yeah, the Gorilla Monsoon book, Irresistible Force. I am starting to like come to the end of the interview phase. I have like a definitive really? list wow. of people. Okay. Well, I, I'll just say more than halfway done. Let's just say. <laughs> I've done like about 30. I want to do like maybe about 20 more. There's just so many people. But I just talked to – I've talked to so many people. I talked to Mario Savoldi. I talked to Gary Michael Capetta. I just talked to uh, Irish Davey O'Hannon. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> tomorrow I have an interview with Bobby the Brain Heenan's daughter who I want to talk to oh, wow. about You know their very special friendship that they had, Bobby and Gorilla. And I'm talking to um, – tomorrow I have another big one. Oh, well, oh, that's for the podcast. But but I'm doing all <laughs> these different interviews now, and the story is starting to take shape of the life of, you know, Gino Morella, Gorilla Monsoon, the whole thing. And it's a relief. It's a, it's a very nice, heartwarming story, which is a nice break from the original Sheik, which was like much more skeletons in the closet kind <laughs> of a thing. This is a very warm story. I'm, I'm looking for – it's different, and I'm looking forward to telling a different kind of story. 
Um, so, so there's that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping my, my goal is by mid to late summer to begin the actual, like, writing words on the page. It's exciting. Oh, yeah. yeah. And kind of going full circle to the beginning of this conversation and, and talking about that, that seventies era, which is so many of those figures. I mean, sadly we're, we're losing. And when you lose them, you, you lose um, that, that bit of history, those storytellers. So whenever you could have a project like this, where you can, you know, capture some of those stories and uh, record them in the pages of a book. I mean, that's, that's invaluable, right? Yeah, I know because I, but superstar Billy Graham was on my right. list and I started going like, I think he's a little too sick to talk. Probably I was, I was trying to send feelers out because I wanted to talk to him because I mean, gorilla had that, there was that famous thing in the, where people thought superstar Billy Graham was dead. Died, right. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that happened because he fell off the face of the wrestling world after he lost mm -hmm. the title. And there was a rumor that he died and it was partly propagated by the fact that gorilla monsoon who had a newspaper column in Philadelphia reported that he had died and the story was that <laughs> billy graham then called him up and said hey dude i'm alive and gorilla did not ever retract it so i wanted to talk to billy about it and see if there was heat or what so i that then that may be a story that's gone now you know, so did monsoon like, think he was dead I don't know. That's the thing. Because <laughs> I don't know if he was just going along with the urban legend, like, oh, I guess he's dead, or if there was heat. Because Couldn't he just text him or something? <laughs> <laughs> I had a thought in my head because I heard, another, I heard an interview with Gorilla that he did once on, Phil, on, on Philadelphia radio where he was less than complimentary about superstar Billy Graham in a way that didn't sound like a I'm working. It sounded like a shoot. And so it's got me thinking like, did they have a problem? Did he, was he trying to bury him? Like, what was this? And so I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to the bottom of that. Now they're both gone. And I, you know, yeah. I and, and yeah. And they take those stories with them. Right. You know, right, it, right. It, it's uh it's tragic. Yeah. So absolutely. Whenever there's an opportunity to, uh, preserve history. Um, it, it's great. You, you want to jump at it. I mean, I think that a different way, but like, you know, it's concert season this summer and you, a lot of these old timers who maybe don't have as much gas in the tank as they did 30, 40 years ago, but it's like, this might be the last time that, to see some of these uh, acts. And if you don't go see them, there may not be another tour. So uh, yeah, I hear you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll be back soon.